What's up, Brozones? Welcome to the Ozone and welcome to the <laughs> Oh, that was a that was a really bad intro. Uh, welcome to the last ever Fazbear Frights audiobook. Uh, well, actually, technically, it's not because I haven't finished the Fetch audiobooks, but they're gonna come after this one. But this is the last story in the Fazbear Frights books. There is no epilogue to this book. Uh, this is You're the Band, the last story in Felix the Shark. And honestly, this is a great end to the series. You're going to really enjoy this story. Um, I haven't read it properly, but I have read the summary of it and it looks fantastic. So I'm excited to get into this. Uh, guys, if you have been coming along and listening to my audiobooks all this time, uh, for all of the Phasma Frights books, then I just want to say... A huge thank you. Honestly, all of your support has been amazing. Um, I've had a lot of people come and go, uh, and a lot of people saying that they really enjoy the audiobooks, and a lot of people saying that they, they don't really like the style of it, because I talk too much in some of them. But um, honestly, I, I'm sticking with the style, because uh, I, I quite like just, you know, reacting to them as well as, uh, as reading them, because otherwise it's quite boring, you know. Um, so I hope you have been enjoying the audiobooks. Uh, I will be back for Tales from the Pizza Plex, which is set to release in July. I can't remember when, I think it's July or August. Um, but yeah, I just wanted to say a huge thank you because it's been amazing making these audiobooks and um, yeah, I, I can't wait to do it for Tales from the Pizza Plex. Anyway, you're the band. This is going to be so good. You're in for a treat. This is actually a short one. This is the shortest one of the, uh, of the Felix the Shark book. Uh, but it's it's a pretty good one, so uh, hold on tight, and let's get straight into it. You can come back now, Dr. Monroe said, standing in the doorway that led from the waiting room to the area where she saw patients. Sylvia sat, set down the magazine she had been pretending to read, even though it was one of those trashy celebrity gossip rags where the stories were written on a first grade level. She couldn't concentrate. Her mind was too busy thinking about, uh, worrying about, what Timmy was saying to Dr. Monroe. Rationally, she, saw, she knew loads of kids went to see psychologists, and the fact that Timmy was too shouldn't make her feel bad about herself as a mother. But parental guy uh, guilt wasn't rational, and so she couldn't help playing the voice over and over in her head that said, it's your fault, it's your fault Timmy is in trouble, it's your fault Timmy isn't acting right. Timmy had always been such a happy, easy-going child, as a baby, he hardly cried and slept through the night immediately. As a preschooler, all she had to do was see a tub of blocks or paper uh, and crayons in front of them, and he could amuse himself for hours. Once he started school, his teachers talked about what a nice kid he was, how there were never any behavioural behavioral problems with Timmy. But then there had been the phone call from Miss Lotz, Timmy's current teacher, saying Timmy didn't seem himself and asking if there might be a problem at home she should be made aware of. There definitely wasn't a problem, but Sylvia didn't... Uh, sorry, there definitely was a problem, but Sylvia didn't know what it was. That was why she had brought Timmy to see Dr. Monroe. Sylvia followed the doctor down the hall and into a child-friendly room with one small table for playing blocks and another for drawing. Shelves around the room were filled with picture books and dolls and stuffed animals. Timmy was st sitting at the drawing table, hunched over a piece of paper with great concentration. Please sit in one of the big chairs, Dr. Monroe said with his pleasant smile. Like a child psychologist should be, she seemed patient and good-humoured, easy to talk to. Sylvia sat down in a wing-backed uh, wing armchair across from Dr. Monroe's desk. She looked at Timmy, but he didn't look up from his drawing. I often encourage children to draw pictures during a session, Dr. Monroe said. Sometimes they show things they can't describe in words. And speaking of that, she leaned toward D Timmy to be closer to his eye level. Timmy, can I show your mum the drawing you gave me? Timmy nodded. Dr. Monroe grabbed a piece of sketch paper from her desk and held it to Sylvia. Sylvia looked at her son's artwork, which featured a cartoon bear in a top hat, a blue bunny and a yellow chick. These characters had been showing up in Timmy's drawings a lot lately. Timmy, can you tell your mum about that drawing? Timmy sighed like he was annoyed to be interrupted in his work, but he wanted, uh, sorry, he walked to, 
to the picture Sylvia was holding and pointed at the characters. That's Freddy, Bonnie and Chica, he said. They were in the band when I went there. When you went there? Dr. Monroe said gently. Tell your mum. Timmy looked up at his mummy with guideless uh, b brown eyes. When I went to Freddy's. See, this is the kind of thing he keeps saying, Sylvia said, trying not to let her fear come out in her voice. But it doesn't make sense. There is no Freddy's. Right, there hasn't been for a long time, Dr. Monroe said. Not since that tragic incident happened, what, 30 years ago? But I remember going there when I was about Timmy's age for drink, for, <laughs> for drinking, for birthday parties and that kind of thing. She took the drawing from Sylvia and studied it. These are definitely the characters who were in the animatronic band, but I was never interested in them when I went there. I was at Freddy's for one purpose, and that purpose was pizza. Sylvia managed a polite smile. She knew the doctor was trying to put her at ease, but she was too worried about Timmy to joke around. So, do you think you can help him? She asked. May I talk to you in the hall for a second? Dr. Monroe asked. Tell me, we'll be right back, okay? Okay, Timmy said, still absorbed in his drawing. In the hallway, Dr. Monroe said, To answer your question, I do think I can help Timmy, but I would be lying if I said I wasn't confused about the behaviours he's exhibiting. It's very confusing, Sylvia agreed. It felt good to talk to someone who was trying to understand and help. A lot of the time, he seems like a different person. He'll talk about things he couldn't possibly have experienced, like they're in the present day. It's like he's two different people. The Timmy I've always known, and then some kid I don't. The worst thing is... Sylvia felt tears coming on, but did not want to cry in front of Dr. Monroe. Sometimes I feel like the Timmy I know is disappearing and being replaced by this other kid. I know that must be difficult for you, Dr. Monroe said. But the Timmy that you know and love is still there. We'll get this figured out, Miss Collins. When did Timmy start exhibiting this behaviour? It's weird how little boys get obsessed with things, Sylvia had said one week ago. She was stretched out on the couch, talking to her best friend Maria on the phone. Tell me about it, Maria said. With Miles, it's dinosaurs, and heaven help me if I mispronounce the mile-long name of a dinosaur in one of his books. Then I am officially the dumbest mummy ever in his opinion. Sylvia laughed. Timmy had a dinosaur phase too, but now he's all about Freddy Fazbear. The pizza place from back in the day, Maria said. How did he even find out about it? The internet, I guess, Sylvia sighed. And I'll tell you, finding Freddy's related merchandise nowadays is no picnic. I've been trying to find Freddy party supplies for his birthday, but I haven't had any luck. It's too bad because Freddy's is it's literally all he talks about these days. He watches all these videos about the characters. And then there aren't... Uh, wait, who... Okay, never mind. Then there are all the creepy conspiracy theory videos about the murders that took place at Freddy's back when we were kids. I was pretty little when those happened, but I still remember it, Maria said. Except for school and church. Mama didn't let us out of the house for a month. I don't blame her, Sylvia said. You know, I kind of wish Timmy would lay off the conspiracy videos. It's some pretty dark stuff. But at the same time, I know if I tell him not to watch them, he'll only want to watch them more. Yeah, I'll just wait it out if I were you, Maria said. Soon, he'll be bored with Freddy and move on to whatever his next obsession will be. Probably so, Sylvia said. It's weird the phases they go through. And then he'll grow up to be a man and bore women to death, talking about football or whatever his big boy obsession is. Sylvia laughed. Once she hung up with Maria, Sylvia continued her internet search for Freddy party paraphernalia. <laughs> paraphernalia? What is that? She looked at the party depot site and found some, uh, <laughs> some generic paper plates and napkins decorated in a balloon and confetti design. She bought them on the theory that nobody would be selling used paper plates and napkins from over 30 years ago. And even if they were, who would buy them? In a sudden burst of inspiration, she logged on to an auction site. She typed in Freddy Fazbear. The first item she saw listed was a Freddy Fazbear Halloween mask, which had been posted by a seller named Retro Merch, with threes instead of E's, because they're cool. She, she clicked on the listing and a photo appeared. The mask was large, the kind that would fit over a person's entire head. It was brown and fuzzy with round barriers and Freddy's trademark top hat. She knew Timmy would love it. Shockingly, no one had bid on the mask yet, even though it had been on sale for five days. Sylvia was about to place a bid when she saw another person on the screen. 
buy it now for a hundred dollars. It was a splurge, but Timmy's birthday just came once a year and she knew the mask would make him really happy. She clicked on the link and made the purchase. That night, as she lay in bed, it dawned on Sylvia that she should have looked at Retro Merch's other items. Maybe they had other Freddy stuff. She briefly considered picking up her phone to look, but it was already late, and she knew if she spent too much time staring at a screen, she would never get to sleep. Ooh. This is so good. It's getting straight into it, right? We're only like a couple pages in, and it's already like, uh, like a lot more developed as a story than like Felix the Shark and, uh, and the Scoop. Timmy sat at the breakfast table while Sylvia sliced bananas over his bowl of cornflakes. He was wearing a Freddy Fazbear t-shirt Sylvia had found in a thrift shore, store. Uh, it was the only t-shirt he wanted to wear anymore. When Sylvia insisted on washing it, he would go shirtless until it was clean and dry. Mom, Timmy said, who was your favourite character from Freddy's? He crunched his, cor his cornflakes. Sylvia listened to Timmy prattle about these characters all the time, but she had a hard time keeping their names straight. Freddy was the only one she could remember clearly, but saying he was her favourite seemed like a cop-out. I like the bird, she tried. She was almost certain there was a bird. You mean Chica, Timmy said, sounding like a teacher correcting a student. Yeah, Sylvia said. I think she's cute, all yellow and fuzzy. I like Chica too, but Freddy's my favourite because he's the star. Timmy shoveled in some more cornflakes. Speaking of getting to be a star, I know somebody has a birthday coming up, Sylvia said. I wonder if you can guess who. Timmy grinned. <gasps> Is it me? S Sylvia smiled back at him. The kid had such a winning smile. I think it might be. My favourite seven-year-old is turning into my favourite eight-year-old. How did that happen? I grew. You did. You've grown so much this year, and I'm so proud of you. Hey, did you get the party invitations handed out to all your friends at school? Uh-huh. Timmy pushed his bowl away. I told them it was going to be a Freddy party, and we're going to have an awesome time. Awesome, Sylvia repeated, still re li feeling a little nervous about pulling off the party. This stuff may have creeped her out, but it made Timmy happy. She smiled down at him. You'd better hurry so you don't miss the bus. Once Timmy was on the bus, Sylvia poured herself a second cup of coffee. She hoped she could deliver on the awesome time Timmy had promised his friends. Sylvia never thought parenting was something she'd have to do by herself. James had been so excited to be a dad and when he found out the baby they were expecting was a boy, he had been over the moon. He'd gone out and bought a soccer ball and a baseball bat right away. Sylvia had laughed and said they were going to have a baby, not a professional athlete. Boy or not, he wasn't going to be ready to kick around a soccer ball for quite some time. Besides, what if the kid turned out not to be interested in sports? James said he would love his son no matter what he was like, and Sylvia knew it was true. But then, just one month before the baby was due, James was involved in a fatal accident at the construction site where he worked. He never got to meet his son he was so excited about having. Sylvia felt tears welling in her eyes, but tried to shake off her sudden fit of melancholy. Really, what she should be focusing on was Timmy's party. She remembered that last night she had thought about going back on the auction site to see if Retro Merch had any other Freddy-related items for sale. She wasn't comfortable with Timmy's Freddy obsession. She felt like if you scratched the surface there was a ghoulish component to it, but if she indulged him now, surely he would get tired of it sooner or later and move on to the next thing. She, looked, she logged onto the site and once again typed in Freddy Fazbear. No items came up. She decided to search by the seller's name. Nothing. There was no evidence of that seller ever existing. It was strange. She hoped she hadn't been scammed. If she had, she would definitely file a complaint with the auction site. At least she hadn't told Timmy he was getting a Freddy mask, so he wouldn't be disappointed when it didn't arrive. But then, just two days before Timmy's birthday party, the mask did arrive. Sylvia found a battered cardboard box on the doorstep. She cut it open, and there, looking a little more weathered than it had in the online picture, was the Freddy Fazbear mask. When she lifted it out of the box, it was surprisingly heavy. It also had a strange smell that Sylvia remembered from her grandmother's closet, when she used to dive behind the musty old coats playing hide-and-seek. Mothballs. She hadn't smelt those in years. She figured she could freshen up the mask with a damp washcloth and a little mild detergent to get rid of the mothball smell. The mask didn't look new, 
But it wasn't supposed to. It was vintage, a collectible. Timmy was going to love it. That evening, over dinner, Sylvia told Timmy, We need to go over your birthday party plans and make sure nothing, there's nothing we're forgetting. Okay, Timmy said, forking up some chicken and rice. So, I've got all the stuff to grill hamburgers and hot dogs outside, and we'll have lemonade to drink. Uh-huh, Timmy said, and I'll pick up the cake at the bakery on Saturday morning. And you'll be a Freddy cake, right? Right. I showed them some pictures, and they said they could do it. Good. Would there be ice cream? Timmy asked. There will be ice cream, Sylvia said, smiling. Vanilla and chocolate, so people can choose either one. Or both, Timmy said, smiling back at her. Yes, both is always a good choice. Sylvia said, reaching over to ruffle his hair. Wow, Sylvia, you really went all out, Sylvia's friend Maria said, surve surveying the backyard's party decorations. There were balloons and steamers. Sorry, <laughs> steamers? Streamers. What's a streamer? <laughs> like a YouTube, like a Twitch streamer? And a traditional donkey piñata. I think I know what a streamer is, don't worry. Uh... And there were also homemade Freddy-themed decorations, too. Even a poster Sylvia had drawn with a cartoon bear, bunny and chicken that read, Freddy and friends say, Happy birthday, Timmy. Sylvia had even decorated the back porch to look like a stage from the old Freddy Fazbear's complete with a red star curtain. Well, I made it as nice as I could, Sylvia said. You only turn eight once, right? Miles, Mariah's son, said, I turn eight in February. <laughs> Sylvia smiled at him. Yeah, and I bet your mum will put together a great party for you. I'll do my best, Maria said. But this will be a tough act to follow. She patted Miles back and said, Why don't you put your present on the table and go play with Timmy and Jamal? Uh, Miles sped off toward the gift table, leaving the two mums alone. So, you think I actually pulled this off? Sylvia asked, watching Miles join his friends. You more than pulled it off, Maria said. I'm impressed. I don't know, Sylvia said. Sometimes I feel like uh, being a single parent, I work twice as hard and only do half as good a job. I'm sure you do work twice as hard, Maria said, giving her a half hug. But you do a great job. Timmy is lucky to have you. Sylvia looked over at Timmy, playing with Miles and Jamal. Is that how you say that? I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing Jamal. Jamal. Uh, climbing on the backyard swing set, joking about silly stuff and laughing extra loud. Her heart smelled with love. We're lucky to have each other, she said. The kids ate hot dogs and hamburgers and cake and ice cream. They took turns, walloping the piñata until it spewed candy. Then they gathered around the picnic table to watch Timmy open his presents. Timmy, before you open the presents from your friends, Sylvia said, I have something special I'd like to give you. She handed him a large box wrapped with balloon and confetti printed paper. The kids at the table let out an ooh of excitement. I don't know what this is, Timmy said. Sylvia laughed. That's the idea. It's a surprise. Timmy tore into the wrapping paper, then opened the box. When he saw the mask, he gasped. Mum, where? Where did you get this? He lifted the mask from the box and held it up so the other kids could see. Oh, I just did a little online shop shopping, Sylvia said. Try it on. I love it, Timmy said, putting it on his head. Well, it's heavy. He looked at his friends. Since I'm Freddy... I'm going to get on the stage and sing. Who wants to be Bonnie? I can be Bonnie, Miles said. That's the rabbit, right? Uh-huh, Timmy said. And we need somebody to be Chica. I'll be Chica, <laughs> Isabella said. She giggled. But I don't know who Chica is. The three kids stood on the porch stage with Timmy in the middle wearing his mask. OK, now we're going to sing our song, Timmy said. He launched into a song that Sylvia figured must have been one of the songs the animatronic band used to perform at the old Freddy Fazbear's Pizza. Timmy must have learned it from those videos he was always watching. Miles and Isabella clearly didn't know the lyrics, so Timmy asked them to just move their lips while he sang their parts. They seemed happy to oblige. Look at you, Sylvia said. You're the band. She snapped a couple of pictures on her phone. After Timmy finished singing, he pulled off the mask. Phew! So cool, but also really heavy, he said, laughing. The kids returned to the table, and Timmy opened the presents everyone else had brought. Sylvia was relieved that she didn't even notice, uh, sorry, that she didn't even once have to remind him to say thank you. 
As the last kids were leaving, Sylvia felt the satisfaction of a job well done. She shouldn't have worried so much. It had been a great party. <laughs> I loved that scene. I love... Oh, that's brilliant. This is... So far, this is actually probably my favourite story. I'm not even joking. This is turning out so well. Why was this scrapped? I think I know why it was scrapped, but we'll have to... I'll have to talk about that later. Anyway, that night, Sylvia was officially ready for some me time. Every night after Timmy was tucked into bed, she gave herself at least an hour to relax and do something she enjoyed. Sometimes it was reading a book, sometimes it was watching a movie that, unlike all the movies she saw with Timmy, was not animated. Sometimes it was just taking a long, leisurely bath. Tonight she had put on her pyjamas and curled up in bed with a mystery novel and a slice of leftover birthday cake. It was, she decided, the perfect combination. After just a few bites and a few pages, Sylvia's relaxation was interrupted by the sound of a scream. It took her a moment to process what she had just heard. Then, there was another scream. Timmy's room. The screams were coming from Timmy's room. In next to no time, Sylvia was out of her bed, on her feet, and running across the hall. Timmy was sitting up in bed. He was breathing hard and his eyes were wide with terror. Did you see it? He asked, his voice breathless. See what? Sylvia said, going to his bed to comfort him. I don't know what it was. It was dark, and it was moving too fast. But it was right there. He pointed at the edge of the bed. Sylvia scooted him to bed next to him. You sure you weren't dreaming? Sometimes dreams can feel awfully real. But it was right here! Timmy seemed on the verge of tears. Well, that's when dreams seem extra real, sweetie, Sylvia said. When you wake up and you're in the same room where the dream took place. But there's nothing here that I can see. Do you want me to look under your bed and in your closet? Timmy nodded. Sylvia got up from the bed, then bent down to look underneath it. Nothing here but dust bunnies. <laughs> dust bunnies? <laughs> dust bunnies? There's sea bunnies and dust bunnies. You're not scared of dust bunnies, are you? No, Timmy said. He sounded a little less scared. She could hear a smile in his voice. All right, now the closet. She opened the door. The closet was cluttered with board games and shoes and jackets. Nothing here but your mess, she said. Okay, Timmy said. So the coast is clear, Sylvia said. Why don't I turn the hall light on so it won't be quite so dark in here and you can go back to sleep. Okay, Timmy said again, laying his head back down on the pillow. As Sylvia pulled the door of Timmy's room half shut the way he liked it, she could feel like she caught the glimpse of something creepy. But at second glance, it was only the Freddy Fazbear mask sitting on the dresser, its unseeing eyes seeming to watch her leave the room. The next morning, Timmy was sleeping late, probably because he was tired from the party and the nightmare that had interrupted his rest. She decided to let him sleep in, which gave her a rare chance to relax with a second cup of coffee in the newspaper. She was pouring her coffee when she heard a rustling sound in the backyard, too loud to be made by a bird or squirrel. She looked out the window and saw nothing out of the ordinary, but the sound continued. She went into the living room and looked out the window, nothing there either. Then she went to the bedroom. She didn't see anything, but the rustling sound grew louder. She remembered Timmy insisting that something had been moving around in his room last night, Maybe she had been wrong to dismiss him so quickly. Maybe there was an intruder who was skulking around in the yard right now. She should probably call the police. Where was her phone? On the kitchen counter, she remembered as she tried to calm herself down. She had set it there when she had come in to make some coffee. She went to the kitchen and picked up her phone, then looked out the window again. The face of a man appeared, making her jump and knock over the cup of coffee she had left sitting on the counter. The man, who was probably in his early twenties, held up his hands and mouthed the words, Sorry. Sylvia put up her index finger in the universal sign for just a minute and went to meet him outside. He didn't look like a serial killer, she decided, and surely most serial killers didn't do their work on Sunday mornings in broad daylight. True. Is there something I can help you with? Sylvia said. The young man was dressed in shorts and a t-shirt and looked like a college kid. I was just looking for my dog, he said. He got off his leash. Sylvia noticed that the young man wasn't holding a leash. I haven't seen a dog, she said. Hey, the young man said, nodding in the direction of the backyard. Looks like you've been having a party. Yes, Sylvia said. 
My son's birthday was yesterday. I needed to take down the decorations. She told herself to stop talking. Why was she explaining herself to this stranger? The decorations are interesting, the young man said. Sylvia nodded. Yeah, just some stuff like my son likes. That bear on the poster. That's Freddy Fazbear, right? There was something strange about the way he asked this question. His curiosity seemed more intense than it should be. Sylvia nodded again, feeling that this conversation was growing increasingly awkward. I thought so, the young man said. There aren't too many kids these days who would even know who Freddy Fazbear is. Oh, I don't know. Kids learn all kinds of things on the internet. Sylvia felt like this conversation had gone on far too long. He had told her he was looking for his dog, and she had told him he hadn't, she hadn't seen it. The conversation should have stopped right there. Why had it felt the why had he felt the need to interrogate her about her kid's birthday party? Listen. Oh, no, <laughs> never mind. Listen. I've got to go, she said. I hope you find your dog. When Sylvia went back inside, Timmy was standing in the kitchen, still dressed in his pajamas. Mom, can I have some cornflakes? He asked. Uh-huh. Timmy sat at his usual spot in the kitchen table. At the kitchen table. Hey, am I still spending the night at Miles tonight? That's right, because tomorrow's a day off from school, Sylvia said, pouring him a glass of orange juice. Lucky you, I still have to go to work. And me and Miles are going to stay up all night long, Timmy said. Is that a fact? Lucky Maria, Sylvia thought. She was going to have a wild night with those two. I bet you won't make it all night. You'll stay up late, but you'll conk out eventually. She sliced a banana over his cornflakes. Did you have fun at your party yesterday? Uh-huh, Timmy said. You know, those kids were at a birthday party too. Sylvia looked up from pouring milk on his cereal. What kids, honey? The kids at Freddy's. She set the bowl in front of him. I don't know what you're talking about. Is this something you watch uh, from one of those weird videos you watch? They found them lined up against the wall, Timmy said matter-of-factly, spooning up cornflakes. Found what? Sylvia said, thoroughly confused. She couldn't put her finger on it. But something about Timmy seemed off. His voice sounded more monotone than usual, and he wasn't making eye contact with her. Found who? Timmy said, like his mum was being ob obtuse. The dead kids at Freddy's. They were lined up against the wall, and they were all wearing party hats. A little shiver ran through Sylvia. Isn't this some kind? Isn't this kind of morbid topic to be talking about? Wait. Never mind. <laughs> a little shiver ran through Sylvia. Here we go. Isn't this kind of a morbid topic to be talking about at breakfast? Timmy crunched his cornflakes. It's not morbid. It's true. Sylvia poured herself some more coffee and popped a slice of bread into the toaster. And you know it's true because you saw it on the internet. She didn't know the details of the murder case, so she didn't know if what Timmy said about the victims was accurate or not. But she did know that automatically believing something just because you saw it online was dangerous. Not everything you see on the internet is true, you know. Timmy rolled his eyes. I know that, but I don't know about the bodies because I saw it on the internet. I know about the bodies because I was there. Sylvia was confused. You were where? At Freddy's when it happened. Timmy chugged some orange juice. Honey, you couldn't have been there, Sylvia said. You're seven years old. I turned eight yesterday, Timmy corrected her. Yes, you turned eight yesterday, and those murders happened about 30 years ago. I was there! Was it Sylvia's imagination, or was Timmy talking in a voice that was different, slower, and a little lower? Uh, no, <laughs> I haven't changed his voice at all, I think it's funny like this. Timmy, you're worrying me, Sylvia said. Her own voice was shaking. What you're saying doesn't make any sense. Don't worry, it's okay. Sometimes adults can't understand, Timmy said. Can I be excused from the table? Can I be excused from the table now? You may, Sylvia said, if you promise to stop messing with me. I'm not messing with you, Timmy said. What are you talking about? Like saying what you said about being at Freddy's the night of the murders. If you were saying that to freak me out, you succeeded. I wasn't saying it to freak you out. I was saying it because it's true. Okay, kid, you're scaring me. She sat down her coffee cup and put her hand on Timmy's forehead. It felt normal, so much for the theory that he was delirious with fever. 
Don't be scared, Timmy said. You're nice. There's no reason to hurt you. Hurt me? There was definitely something wrong with her kid. Sylvia was in danger of crying. Why don't you go and play in your room while I take care of the breakfast dishes, buddy? She said, working hard to ho hold her voice steady. Sylvia was relieved that Tim Timmy was spending the night at Miles's because it gave her a chance to research his symptoms online and decide what the best course of action might be. She was sitting on the couch with her laptop open. Quiet nights alone were rare for her and she generally found them relaxing. But not tonight. She was too worried about Timmy. Also, for some reason, she couldn't quite convince herself that she was actually that she was really alone. There was a slight rattling coming from behind one of the air vents, and when she peeked into the vent's blackness, she expected to see something staring back at her. But of course, there was nothing. Stop it. You're being irrational, she told herself. You're not usually jumpy like this. She went back to reading and sipping her tea. She knew this situation with Timmy had her on edge. If Timmy's dad was still alive, they could talk about the problem over together, but as it was, all the responsibility of making the right decisions for her obviously troubled child uh, her obviously troubled child fell on her. She hoped the psychologist turned out to be helpful. She tried to read a child psychology website, but she couldn't concentrate. Then she heard the noise again, this time the rattling accompanied by a scraping sound. But it wasn't coming from the vent, it was coming from above the ceiling. Sylvia remembered that Mariah had once had a problem with raccoons in her attic, which had caused a lot of damage. Sylvia went to the garage and grabbed the small stepladder and a flashlight, then went to the upstairs hall. She unfolded the ladder, climbed up it, and pushed open the hatch that led to the attic. She stood on the ladder so that her torso was through the attic's opening and shined a flashlight around the low ceilinged space over the boxes of Christmas decorations and storage tubes of out of season clothes. Everything seems to be okay. But then something was grabbing her leg. She gasped. Don't scream, she told herself. She couldn't shake off the grip of whatever it was without being in danger of falling off the ladder. She pulled herself down from the attic opening so she could face her attacker. She looked down to see Timmy. He looked up at her with his big brown eyes. What are you doing, Mum? Sylvia uh, put her hand to her heart and took a couple of deep breaths. A better question is what you're doing. You're supposed to be at Miles's. Timmy shrugged. I couldn't sleep. And then Miles fell asleep, so there wasn't much for me to do. And I decided to come home. So much for the two of them staying up all night, Sylvia thought. I didn't hear you come in. I used the back door, Timmy said. I was trying to be extra quiet in case you'd gone to bed. Sylvia stepped off the ladder. Her breathing was starting to return to normal, at least. Well, bed's where you should be going, mister. It's super late. Timmy nodded. Okay, mum. Good night. Good night, sweetie. Let me know if you have trouble sleeping. Uh-huh, Timmy said, walking toward his room. Usually Timmy would at least put up a small argument about going to bed. It was strange for him to be so docile. But then, Timmy had been acting strange all day. Sylvia felt suddenly very tired and decided to put on her pyjamas, but her ringing phone distracted her. She picked it up and saw Mariah's name on the caller ID. Hey, she answered. Hey, Mariah said. I just wanted to check on Timmy. I walked him to your house to make sure he was safe. I appreciate it, Sylvia said, but I'm kind of surprised he bailed on Miles early. He was really excited about the sleepover. I was surprised too, Mariah said, but to be honest, Syl, I was surprised by a lot of Timmy's behaviour tonight. Sylvia felt a growing sense of unease. Did he misbehave? No, not exactly, Mariah said. Her voice sounded tense. It was more the kind of things he was saying. Some of it didn't make any sense. He was talking about the murders at Freddy Fazbear's like it, he was there and when it happened, even though it was like 30 years ago. He acted weird about other stuff too, like the video game console and Miles's tablet. It was like they were technology he'd never seen before, even though he and Miles play games together all the time. Timmy just didn't seem like himself, and it upset Miles. I'm sorry Miles was upset, Sylvia said. She didn't want to be the mother of the creepy kid. Nor did she want whatever was going on with Timmy to have a negative effect on her friendship with Maria. Mariah. I keep, I think I keep swapping between Maria and Mariah. I'm sorry. 
So, you asked Timmy to leave? I'm sorry, Sil. I don't know what else to do, Mariah said. I tried not to make a big deal out of it. I just said that Miles was tired and maybe it would be better if he came back another day. And like I said, I walked him home. I hope you're not mad at me. I'm not mad, Sylvia said. It was true. In Mariah's position, she would have done the same thing. Just tired and worried. I'm sure you are, Mariah said. So, what do you think is going on with him? Do you think it could be some kind of reaction to what happened to his dad? It could be, I guess, Sylvia said. But Timmy can't even remember his dad. So, why would he be having a traumatic reaction now? If he's still acting strange in a couple of days, I'm going to consult a doctor or a psychologist. Of course, Mariah said. Kids are unpredictable. He may start acting totally normal tomorrow. But I'm glad you've got things under control. Sylvia hung up. The truth was that she felt like nothing was under control. Sylvia pushed the shopping cart down the canned foods aisle of the shopper lot. Timmy walked alongside her. It seemed like only yesterday that he had been small enough to ride in the shopping cart's baby seat. Let me know if you see anything that looks good to you, Sylvia said. Especially if it's something I can pack you for your lunch. Timmy insisted that the school's cafeteria's food was terrible. Based on Sylvia's limited experience with it on parent visitation days, he was right. As a result, she packed Timmy's lunch, but she felt like she always gave him the same thing. A ham or turkey sandwich, a sliced apple or orange, baby carrots with a ranch dip. He never complained that he was getting tired of eating the same lunch over and over, but she certainly got tired of packing it. Oh, those! I want those! Timmy pointed. Uh, Timmy said, pointed at a shelf full of canned pasta and chilli. Which are those? Sylvia said. Sometimes standing in front of the canned foods had sort of a hypnotic effect on her. The labels started to all look alike. Spaghetti wheels, Timmy said, still pointing. The kind with little meatballs. Sylvia was confused. But you always say canned pasta is gross. You just like the pasta I make with butter and cheese. I like spaghetti wheels. Timmy said in the voice that was lower than his usual one. Sylvia felt like she might be sick. She had always felt like she had a thorough knowledge of Timmy's personality, his likes and dislikes. But now looking at her son's face was like looking at the face of a stranger. Okay, she said, her voice shaking. You pick out what you want. I just remembered I need to make a phone call. She walked to the end of the aisle where she could keep an eye on Timmy or on whatever, whoever he was being today and pulled up the results of her child psychologist search on her phone. She dialed the first number that appeared, pediatric psychologists. A bored sounding female voice answered. Yes, Sylvia said, half, half whispering so Timmy couldn't hear her. My son, Timothy Collins, needs to see someone in your practice as soon as possible. Has he threatened to harm someone else? Or, uh, sorry, has he threatened to harm himself or anyone else? The receptionist asked still sounding bored despite the dramatic nature of her question. No, nothing like that, Sylvia said. She watched as Timmy mechanically pulled can after can of spaghetti wheels from the shelf and dropped them in the cart. He's just not himself. Well, ma'am, I can look to see if we have any cancellations and call you back. Is this the best number to reach you? Yes, yes, thank you. Sylvia took a deep breath to try to calm down. She joined Timmy at the cart. Why was she so nervous? A person's child should not make them this nervous. Maybe we don't need to buy every single can of spaghetti wheels in the store, she said, grabbing a can to put it back on the shelf. But I like spaghetti wheels! Timmy yelled so loud that everyone in the store, and many people outside it, could surely hear him. Sylvia felt like she was drowning in feelings. She was embarrassed, but she was also confused and scared. Timmy had never been the kind of kid to yell or throw a tantrum in a store even during the so-called terrible twos. The child standing before her certainly looked like her child, but the resemblance ended, la ended there. Sorry. She knew she should probably p press the issue and make him put some of the cans back, but all she wanted was to get out of the store without any more meltdowns. Okay then, I guess we'll stuck stock up on spaghetti wheels. I'm sorry, I keep mispronouncing words, she said. Uh, she wondered if Timmy could hear the fear in her voice. Anything else we should pick up before we head home? Strawberry ice cream, <laughs> Timmy said. Really? Sylvia asked. Timmy nodded. 
Timmy had always hated strawberry ice cream. Too rattled to cook a real dinner, Sylvia dumped a can of spaghetti wheels into a saucepan on the stove. When her phone rang, it startled her so badly that she needed to set a second to catch her breath before she answered. Hello? Mrs. Collins, this is Laura at Pediatric Psychologists. I have good news. Right after you and I talked, we had a cancellation. There's an open appointment at 10am with Dr. Monroe if you'd like to bring in your son. Yes, I would, Sylvia said, feeling better with knowledge that help was on the way sooner rather than later. That is good news, the first I've heard all day. Thank you. After a meal of spaghetti wheels and salad, Sylvia passed on the slimy noodles and just ate salad, Sylvia said, Okay, to me, you need to take a bath and put on your pyjamas, then you can play or read in your room for half an hour before bed. I hate baths. I want a shower, Timmy said, once again stating the opposite of his usual opinion. A shower's fine too. Just get yourself clean and in your jammies, Sylvia said to the person who was becoming less and less familiar to her. Okay, shower to it, shower to it. Oh my gosh, I, why can't I pronounce words? Shower it is then. Timmy said. Sylvia cleared the table and started to load the dishwasher. One attraction of serving gross convenience food, she supposed, was that it didn't generate many dirty dishes. She bent down to put the forks in the dishwasher's silverware holder. When she stood up, an unfamiliar face was staring at her through the kitchen window. Sylvia screamed. With shaking hands, she picked up her phone and dialed 911. 911, what's your emergency? The operator uh, answered. There's someone creeping around my house. There was a face looking in my kitchen window. And you are at 1919 Larkspur Lane, the operator asked. Yes, a couple of officers will be there shortly. As soon as Sylvia got off the phone, she heard noise coming from upstairs, talking and movement. From Timmy's room. She broke into a run, her heart pounding. What if the intruder was already in the house? Once she was at the door of Timmy's room, she opened it slowly, just a crack. If there was an intruder, she didn't want to startle him with any sudden movements. In his dark room, Timmy sat on the edge of the bed in his pyjamas, talking so softly that she couldn't make out individual words. But, that, but the thing that really frightened her was what Timmy was talking to. It was a shadow, much larger than any shadow Timmy could cast. Or would cast. Uh, it extended from the foot of Timmy's bed all the way up the wall. It shaped vaguely humanoid in that it seemed to have a head and shoulders. The shadow turned to face her, staring at her with beady white eyes, then slinked up the wall and retreated into the air vent. Before she could even process what she saw, did she even really see it? The doorbell rang. The police. She knew she couldn't really tell the police about the shadow thing. They would think she was absolutely crazy. Hi, Mom. I didn't know you were there, Timmy said, noticing her for the first time. Are you going to get the door? Speechless, Sylvia nodded. She hurried down the stairs, not even sure she could find the words to talk to the police. She opened the door to a male and female officer. You reported an intruder on your property, ma'am? The female officer asked. Oh, that's, that's a female officer. <laughs> it's alright, she, she can have a deep voice. Uh, she was a black woman who looked to be around Sylvia's age. Why is black capital? <laughs> uh, her badge said Harris. Yes, Sylvia said. Her voice came out small and meek. I heard footsteps and rustling outside and then a man's face was looking in my window. He ran as soon as he saw me. Officer Harris was taking notes. Can you describe what the man looked like? Sylvia tried to pull some specific images from her memory, but all she could remember was the feeling of being looked at, the basic shape of a human male's face. I I I'm afraid I can't. It looked like a relatively young Caucasian man, but I can't really tell you much more about him. It was already dark outside, and like I said, he disappeared as soon as I, as he saw that I was looking at him. Officer Harris nodded. We'll search the area and make sure he's gone. She held out a card. If you have any more trouble, this is my direct number. <laughs> Sylvia took the card. Thank you. She closed and locked the door. When she turned around, Timmy was standing on the stairs wearing his pyjamas. Is everything okay? He asked. Yes, she said. Except that it's past your bedtime. You need to go to sleep. Okay, Mum. Timmy went back up the stairs. Sylvia had lied. Everything was not okay. In fact, nothing was okay. 
Her child was having some kind of psychological breakdown. Someone who might intend them harm was skulking around the house and Sylvia had just seen a supernatural seeming phenomenon that might or might not have been real. She felt like maybe she was on the verge of a psychological breakdown too. She was scared, but she didn't want to let Timmy know she was scared. And she certainly didn't want to let Timmy know that he was one of the things that scared her. Sylvia wiped away the tear that was crawling down her cheek, picked up the phone and selected mom from her contact list. Hi honey, how are you? Her mom answered. Hi, I'm okay, Sylvia said, hearing herself lie again. She had a strong instinct not to worry about her mother. Oh, sorry, not to worry her mother. No, you're not. I can hear it in your voice. What's going on? Sylvia's tears started again. She should have known she couldn't fool her mom. I'm just going through a bad time. There was somebody here prowling around outside the house and looking into the windows. I called the police and they're searching the area. No wonder you're upset and you're there alone with Timmy. The worry was apparent in her mom's voice. Yeah, Sylvia said. I was wondering, w would it be okay if we came and stayed with you for a couple of days? Of course, you know, you're always welcome. The, best, the bed in the guest room is all ready for you and I'll set up the fold out bed for Timmy. Sylvia let herself smile a little. He loves that fold out bed for some reason. But then another wave of anxiety hit her. There was no way that Timmy's increasingly bizarre behavior would go unnoticed by her parents. But listen, uh, there's something you and dad need to know about Timmy. What's that? The worry in her mum's voice again. The worry was in her mum's voice again. He's been acting strangely. He has an appointment in the morning with a psychologist, actually. Strange how? Sylvia didn't know where to start. He's not been violent or anything like that, but his thoughts are confused. He's not himself. Well, being a kid these days is hard. I'm glad you're getting him some help. We'll talk more when you're here, okay? Okay, Sylvia said, sniffling. Come on over as soon as you're ready. Thanks, Mum. We'll leave after Timmy's appointment in the morning. Sylvia walked up the stairs to Timmy's room with a ball of fear in her stomach. She hoped she didn't see the shadow thing again. Well, he's certainly been through a lot in a short period of time, Dr. Monroe said as she and Sylvia stood in the hallway of her office. You've both been through a lot. Sylvia nodded. She didn't want to start crying again, but there was a lump in her throat. Timmy is dissociating, Dr. Monroe said. It's a normal defense mechanism of childhood. You have no idea how relieved I am to hear you say the word normal, Sylvia said. Well, there are varying degrees of severity when it comes to dissociation, Dr. Momo said. But at this point, it's too early to judge how severe Timmy's case is. I'd like to see him once a week for the next couple of months at least. Dissociation is often a response to stress. So if we figure out what's really bothering him, then I can help him work through his problems instead of mentally running away from them. Okay, good, Sylvia said. The news wasn't as bad as she had anticipated. Dr. Monroe didn't seem to be at all alarmed by Timmy's strange behaviour. She had even used the word normal. Is there anything I can do at home to help him? The main advice I'd give is to talk to him and try to engage him whenever he dissociates, Dr. Monroe said. Talk to him about experiences you've had together, about things that you know he likes and is interested in. Don't give him the option of mentally going away and becoming some other imaginary child. I can do that, Sylvia said. He and I are going to stay with my mum for a, a, a mum and dad for a couple of nights. With everything that's happened, I just feel the need to get away for a little bit, you know? Dr. Monroe nodded. I think that's an excellent idea. The change of scene will do both of you good. It was only a 40 minute drive to Sylvia's mum and dad's house. If she got Timmy up early enough in the morning while they were staying with their parents, uh, she could easily drop him at school before heading into the office. Right now, though, she had to admit she was enjoying driving in the opposite direction of her worries. It felt good being out on the open road, listening to music with the windows rolled down, with Timmy napping in his booster seat. Sylvia felt like she was literally uh, leaving her problems behind. Sylvia had grown up in a modest two-bedroom house out in the country. Her parents owned a couple acres of land and put out a big garden every year. Just seeing the familiarity of the place made her feel calmer than she had felt in days. Mum greeted them at the door with hugs. You two get in here, she said, shooting them. Uh, sorry, shooing, <laughs> shooting them. <laughs> shooing them into the house. 
Uh, Timmy, you're growing so fast. We're gonna have to put a brick in. <laughs> what is going on? Oh, I, my mind has gone completely crazy. Um, Sylvia's mom made this joke almost every time she saw Timmy, but he was still polite enough to laugh. Don't put a brick on my head, Nana. And Sylvia, you look tired and thin. Her mom always carried a little extra weight and expressed worry that Sylvia tended to be slightly underweight. We'll get you fed and rested up while you're here and we'll make sure Timmy gets plenty of fresh air and sunshine. That's the best therapy there is. Thanks, Mum. Sylvia was pretty sure that fresh air and sunshine wasn't the only kind of therapy Timmy needed, but she was still grateful for her mum's affectionate welcome. When they walked into the living room, Sylvia's dad said, Hey, there's my Timbo. Get over here. He opened his arms for a hug, and Sylvia was relieved to see that Timmy obliged. Then dad hugged her too, and half whispered, Your mum told me about the creep that was hanging around last night. I worry about you living there in the city all by yourself. You want to think about having an alarm system put in. I'll definitely think about it, Sylvia said. Since her parents had always lived in the country, they tended to think of the small city where Sylvia lived as full of danger. The thing was, crime and noise had never scared her. It was the unknown that she feared, the threats she couldn't adjust for, and this week had been full of them. For dinner, Dad had grilled steaks, and Mom had made mashed potatoes and a huge salad. The four of them sat together at the dining room table. No salad for me, please, Timmy said. But you usually love this salad, Sylvia's mum said. It's the kind with the mandarin orange slices and dried cranberries. I don't like salad, Timmy yelled. Sylvia watched her mum and dad exchange an uncomfortable look. Mum, dad, maybe it would be a good idea to remind Timmy of some of the fun things he gets to do while he visits here. Well, Timbo, her dad said. Sounding like someone trying to <laughs> trying a little too hard to be cheerful. You know how you've always liked help to... <laughs> You know how you've always liked helping me out in my workshop? I thought while you're here, we, we we might go out there and work on a building, a birdhouse. You can take it home with you and hang it on a tree in your yard. And then later, Sylvia's mum chimed in, I thought we might bake and decorate some sugar cookies. Timmy looked back and forth between his grandparents. Does that sound like fun, Timmy? Sylvia prompted him. Building a birdhouse with Pop Pop and then baking cookies with Nana? Uh-huh, Timmy said. Sylvia felt an overwhelming sense of relief. Good. But right now, Timbo, Sylvia's dad said, you should eat your steak. The protein will make you big and strong. He looked at Timmy's plate. Oh, I see your Nana just gave you a butter knife. That's no good for cutting a real piece of meat. Let me help you. He got up and approached Timmy, holding a sharp steak knife. <laughs> <laughs> Timmy sprang from his seat and tackled his grandpa, <laughs> knocking him to the floor and wrestling the knife from his hand. No, don't hurt Timmy, don't hurt Timmy. What in the world? Sylvia's mum cried. Sylvia pulled Timmy off her dad and peeled Timmy's fingers off the knife. Are you okay, dad? She asked. Her heart was pounding in her chest. Sylvia's dad pulled, up, uh, pulled himself up to a sitting position. I'm not hurt, just rattled and confused. <laughs> confused. He looked at Timmy. Son, I wasn't going to hurt anybody with that knife. I was just going to help you cut your steak. God. Children in Fortnite these days. I just sawed your knife, Timmy said. And I had to protect the others. I don't understand. Who were you trying to protect? Sylvia's mum asked with a tremor in her voice. Timmy looked at his grandmother as though she had just asked a really silly question, but refused to say another word throughout dinner. After Timmy was finally in bed, Sylvia sat in the living room with her parents. She wasn't surprised that there was tension in the air. She knew they were upset over Timmy's behaviour at dinner. I'm sorry about what happened, she said. It's not your fault, her mum said, patting Sylvia's arm. Whatever the trouble is with Timmy, it's not your fault. What's important is that he's getting the help and support he needs. We also are concerned that you're getting the help and support you need. What do you mean? Sylvia asked. Your mum and I were talking about after you called last night, Dad said, his brow creased with worry. 
And we just want you to know that if you and Timbo want to move back in here with us, you're more than welcome. Even after what happened at dinner, Silvery, Sylvia asked. I keep wanting to say silver. Uh, her, her dad smiled. Even after what happened at dinner, he didn't mean to hurt me. He was just trying to protect himself. I'm just sorry he thought he needed protection from me. Well, Sylvia said, she hadn't seen this idea coming. I mean, thanks for your offer. That's very generous, but I have a job in the city and Timmy has school. Sylvia's dad smiled at her. We've got an elementary school here too. You should know you went to it. And I'm pretty sure I could talk Bill Davis into giving you a job at the feed store again. He always says you are the one of the best workers he's ever had. Sylvia was having a hard time imagining going back to her, wa her rural life. This is really sweet of you, but I mean, this is a two-bedroom house. You don't want Timmy and me here crowding you out. Well, you living here would just be a temporary arrangement, Mum said. I'm sure in time we could find a little house for just you and Timmy. You certainly have put a lot of thought into this, Sylvia said. Well, we worry about you living in the city by yourself, Dad said. You've got robbers, or worse, trying to break into your house. Your eight-year-old son is all confused and talking about murders. It's time for you to come home, Sylvie. And if you did come home, Mum added, we could help a lot with Timmy. I can't imagine how hard it is to be a single parent, especially to a child who's, she paused, seeming to search for the right words, having problems. I appreciate the offer, Sylvia said, and I'll definitely think about it. Of course, Mum said. It's not the kind of decision you'd want to rush into, she stood up. Well, your dad and I are probably going to turn in. Bedtime comes early here in the country. What was now called the guest room had been Sylvia's room when she was a kid. Being there as an adult always felt strange. Now the room was decorated with a few tasteful floral prints on the wall. But Sylvia could remember when the walls had been papered with posters of her favourite pop stars and the bookcase had been full of paperback kids' mysteries and she'd bought at the school book fair. It was strange enough being in her old room. It was even stranger to think of moving back here with Timmy. She tried to picture herself working at the feed store where she had worked when she was in high school and community college. As soon as she'd graduated, she had moved to the city, gotten a job in a law office, and met Timmy's dad. If she moved back here, it would feel like none of those things had ever happened, like no time had passed at all. As Sylvia took her pyjamas out of her overnight bag, she heard a dog barking outside. Soon it was a chorus of dogs, more dogs than she already, uh, than she had ever, sorry, than she had even known were in this country neighbourhood, woofing and yipping and baying with no signs of stopping. She wondered what the dogs were responding to. Given her recent experiences, she feared an intruder, but here it was more likely to be a possum or a raccoon. She left her pyjamas on the bed and went out to the back porch to see what was going on. Out here, the barking was almost unbearably loud and constant. It didn't sound like any of the dogs were even stopping to take a breath. Her parents' hound dog, Boo, was standing outside the doghouse in his fenced lot, barking non-stop in his deep hound's bellow. Sylvia looked around but could see no cause of the canine chaos. She went back inside. On her way to the guest room, she decided to look in on Timmy and see if all the noise had woken him. She peeked through the doorway of the little sewing room where her mum always set up his fold-out bed. The bed was there, but Timmy was gone. The bed was rumpled, as if he had thrown off the covers. Sylvia's heart was pounding. Maybe he'd just gone to the bathroom. But then she saw the open window. It definitely had been shut when she had tucked him in for the night. Sylvia ran to the window and looked out. Uh, and looked out it for signs of Timmy. I just realised, is this a uh, midnight motorist? Kind of like parallel? Because of the, uh, the open window? I, I guess not, but... <laughs> Uh, halfway across the length of the backyard, a large shadowy figure walked, holding a small boy by the hand. Oh, actually, it could be. It could be a midnight motorist parallel. Timmy! Sylvia screamed. Timmy! But her voice was drowned out by the sound of the barking dogs. With the strength and agility that only comes during an emergency, Sylvia climbed out the window. She hit the ground running, chasing Timmy and the shadowy captor. But even though Sylvia was running and Timmy and the shadow thing were just walking, she still couldn't catch them. They were always just out of reach, like the pool of clear water imagined by the uh, parched person crawling across the desert. 
Timmy! She yelled again, but her son didn't even turn around. Suddenly, a pair of hands grabbed Sylvia and put her into the bushes. She screamed, though she knew no one would hear it over the dogs going crazy. The man standing before her and holding her arms was strangely familiar. Suddenly, she recognised him as the man who was in her yard, supposedly searching for his lost dog. Looking at him, she realised that the face in her kitchen window the night before was also his. You, she said. You followed us all the way out here? She was crying and flailing around, trying to break free of his grip. What do you want from us? I want you to listen to me. That's all, he said. I'm not going to hurt you. Just take some deep breaths and listen. His tone was gentle. Oh, never mind. But he didn't relinquish uh, his grip of her arms. How do you know I can trust you? She, she asked. Her breathing was shallow, like a scared rabbit's. You don't, he said. But just give me a chance. My name is Mike. I'm a security guard at the old Freddy Fazbear's Pizza. The building got broken into a few weeks ago, and one of the things stolen was the head of an animatronic bear. Your son got a mask like that for his birthday, right? Sylvia was a riot of emotions, with fear and confusion topping the list. Still, she managed to nod. <laughs> It's Michael Afton. It has to be Mike Schmidt. Old Freddy's but it's security guard. <laughs> this is like crazy. Uh, <laughs> Listen, I know this sounds crazy, but that mask may have harmed your son. The only way to reverse the damage is for me to take it back. Then please take it, Sylvia said. Tears were pouring down her cheeks. Was the Freddy mask the cause of Timmy's problems? But how could it be? It didn't make sense. Mike smiled sheepishly. Well, to tell you the truth, I already took it after you and Timmy left the house today. It was the only object in your home that I touched, I promise. Okay, Sylvia said. So you got the mask back by breaking and entering. But how do I get my son back? He was led off into the woods by that thing. I think I know where to find him, Mike said. Come with me. Sylvia was expecting Mike to lead her into the woods, but instead he led her to his car. Hop in, he said. Despite the instincts screaming at her from every mystery novel she'd ever read, Sylvia did as she was told. She was very aware that she didn't really know Mike and didn't know if she could trust him. But he said he could help her find Timmy. So she was willing to take her chances. What other choice did she have? She couldn't exactly tell the police that her child had been abducted by some kind of shadow monster. Mike drove through the city and into a neighbourhood that had seen better days. Old stores sat empty, their windows broken and patched with electrical tape. Mark Pi uh, Mark Mike parked across the street from a dilapidated abandoned building that looked like it had once been a restaurant. I reckon this is uh this is also Jeff's Pizza. This is the same. I reckon this is the same pizzeria from like Jeff's Pizza. Um, actually maybe not. I was just thinking because the city had like. Br like broken patched that w windows broken and patched with electrical tape and stuff i was wondering because like in into the pit obviously the mill had closed and the town had been like run down it was as dead as a possum you know anyway um is this the place sylvia was growing even more uneasy why would timmy be here was mike tricking her had he brought her to this abandoned place because he was really a ser serial killer yep the old freddy fazbear's mike said what's left of it in a twisted way, things were starting to make sense. This is where the murders happened all those years ago? Yeah, Mike said. Come on, we're going inside. He reached into the back seat and produced the Freddy Fazbear mask. When she had bought the mask for Timmy, she thought it was cute and comical. Now, when she looked at it, she wondered how she could ever have had that opinion. The empty eyes, the ghoulish grin, the thing was terrifying. Mike sprinted across the street toward the crumbling structure, and Sylvia followed. When Mike unlocked the door, it opened with a creak like a horror movie sound effect. He turned on his flashlight and gestured for Sylvia to follow him. Together they walked through a winding hallway, the pitch blackness of which was, uh, of which was interrupted only by the beam from Mike's flashlight. The walls were decorated with fading pictures of Freddy Fazbear and other animal characters. Their smile seemed strangely ma malevolent to Sylvia. At last, they came to a, a large open room. 
Mike aimed his flashlight at the back wall where, set upon a small stage, Timmy stood between an animatronic rabbit and an animatronic chick. Bonnie and Chica, Sylvia thought. That's what Timmy had called them. The animatronics were moving their mouths to some horrible recorded song that had, ground, that had grown tinny and indistinct with age, but Timmy apparently still recognised it because he was singing his heart out. <laughs> what are we waiting for? Get him down from there, Sylvia said, running toward the stage. No, don't do it, Mike yelled, before Sylvia could reach the stage. Black and white striped tentacles shot from the cracks in the wall and with lightning speed wrapped around Sylvia's arms, legs and waist. Another tentacle sneaked its way around her neck, stopping just short of strangling her. Sylvia s struggled against her restraints, but they only bound her tighter. She was immobilised. That's right, my friends. The puppet is here. <laughs> Oh, now do you understand why this is such a good story? <laughs> the puppet is here! Finally! I've waited all series for a puppet story. <laughs> and it's the last story. And it's a scrapped story. Oh my god! Oh. Psychic. <laughs> Psychic, if you're listening to this. You probably had the same reaction as me, right? <laughs> uh, okay. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm going to keep reading. Uh, we're so close to the end, by the way. I can't believe like there's like nothing else to this. Uh, what the? Mike yelled, running towards Sylvia. He tugged on the tentacle that had a dangerous hold on Sylvia's neck. It didn't budge. Don't worry about me, Sylvia said. Save Timmy! Not yet, Mike said in a half whisper. What do you mean? Sylvia said. Just give it one more minute, Mike muttered. The awful, broken-sounding recording was reaching some kind of crescendo. Uh, I, I don't know how to pronounce that word. I think I pronounced it right. Timmy's singing grew louder and louder. Mike leaped onto the stage and put the Freddy Fazbear mask over Timmy's head. As soon as the mask was in place, its eyes lit up with an eerie glow. Mike yanked the mask from Timmy's head, threw it aside, then grabbed Timmy and pulled him off the stage. A panel opened in the ceiling above them, and down came a doll-like feature with a skinny black-clad body and a clownishly painted face with empty black eye sockets. Its limbs were long and snaky and black and white striped. Mike looked up at the monstrous figure, his mouth open in an unheard scream. He covered Timmy's body with his own to protect him. The figure stopped in midair, and as Sylvia, Timmy and Mike looked on, another figure walked across the room and took his place on the stage between Bonnie and Chica, Freddy Fazbear wearing the head Mike had just returned. The tinny music started to play again, and the horrible doll-like creature disappeared back into the hole in the ceiling, taking the tentacles that had bound Sylvia with her. Sylvia took one of Timmy's hands and Mike took the other. They ran and didn't look back. Wow. Such a good section. <laughs> Once they were in the car, all panting for breath, Mike asked Sylvia, Do you want to go home or back to your parents' house? I want to go home, Timmy said from the back seat. You heard the kid, Sylvia said. She would text her parents to let them know they were okay. She could figure out how to get her car back tomorrow. What? What exactly happened back there? Mike pulled the car out into the road. All I know is that something was alive in that Freddy Fazbear head, and when Timmy put it on, that living thing went inside him. That's why I felt weird, Timmy asked. Exactly, Mike said. Sylvia shook her head. This was all too strange to take in. But what was the shadow thing? The shadow knew that the living thing was inside Timmy. I think it was trying to get it out. Mike briefly took his eyes off the road to look back at Timmy. You know that all of this has to stay a secret. You can't tell anybody. You got that, buddy? I got it, Timmy said. Mike looked over at Sylvia. That goes for you too. Sylvia felt an unexpected laugh bubble up. Who would believe me? The next morning, Sylvia was so happy to have Timmy home that she got up early to make his favourite chocolate chip pancakes. She had to call him five times to get him to wake up. And when he finally came down the stairs, his eyelids were droopy and he was yawning. It filled Sylvia's heart with joy to have him home and safe. What would you say to some chocolate chip pancakes? She said. Timmy gave a sleepy smile. I would say that sounds great. Sylvia smiled back at him. 
The voice he had spoken in was definitely his own. And what would you say if I said that because we had such a rough night, we should stay home from work and school and spend the night together, uh, the day together? Timmy smiled wider. I would say that sounds even greater. <laughs> I'm crying. <laughs> That's the end of Fast Beth Rights. <laughs> oh. That's the end. No more Fast Beth Rights, guys. You have done it. You've read through every single story. Probably, anyway. <laughs> Unless you're waiting for me to cover the fetch stories. <laughs> oh my god. That story is genuinely A plus tier. At least, like, at least A plus tier. Uh, or at least A. Like, that is such a good story. And freaking hell, I don't know why that's a scrapped story. I don't know, I don't really truly know why any of these are scrapped stories, they're still really good stories, and the thing about this one that bugs me is, yes, it's scrapped, but technically it's canon, <laughs> and it's like, um, and uh, let me just give a little brief uh, explanation for that, uh, essentially, the kids that Timmy saw is essentially exactly the same image as we were described in Into the Pit, and not only that, I, th I actually think that that place that uh, Mike and Sylvia went to, I, I actually think that was, you know, a form of that pizzeria or Jeff's Pizza or something. I don't know how that fits into the timeline though, because both of them were technically 30 years after the incident. Um, but I'll have to figure that out. Uh, but also uh, adding on to that is Larson in the Stitch Wraith Stinger, where he like goes into the pit loads of times or whatever uh, and sees loads of different memories. Uh, is, uh, Larson actually goes into Timmy's bedroom, I believe. You're, I, you're gonna have to do some research on that. Uh, I'm gonna have to do more research on that. But I believe there are a few ways in which this connects to the rest of the Fazbear Fried stories, which is pretty epic, but it is a scrap story, so that's kind of confusing. Um, guys, I, tell me what you thought of this story. This was excellent. This was exactly what I wanted in a Fazbear Fright story. This is exactly the way I wanted it to end. Um, the puppet came out of nowhere, quite literally, and it was a fantastic reveal. And I'm so glad that the puppet finally got a story because the puppet, to me, is a very underrated character, underused character. Uh, I don't even know why the puppet isn't in FNAF AR yet. Oh, I, I know why. Uh, Freaking Illumix. <laughs> uh, anyway. I'm going to stop talking because that is the end of the uh, the audiobook. But guys, seriously, if you have been using my audiobooks, thank you so much. I I am on the verge of tears because this is ending. Um, it's been a great ride. I will see you in Tales from the Pizzaplex. Uh, I might even cover the novels, the original trilogy. Tell me if that's something that you want because uh, I do need to reread them. <laughs> but um, yeah... This has been a great journey. Uh, thank you guys so much for joining me. Make sure you subscribe if you haven't already. Uh, and yeah, I will see you in Tales from the Pizzaplex. And when I finish the Fetch audiobooks eventually. <laughs> anyway, thank you so much for listening. And uh, yeah, I will see you later. Goodbye. <laughs>